Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tiago, or if it's easier in your language, uh, Tiago uh, doesn't mind. To me, I'll talk about GDB uh, variable size registers, also in GDB server and the remote protocol. So, uh, this is our topic that we'll talk about. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, these are the topics we'll talk about, uh, a little bit about motivation, uh, the GDB target description, which is an important concept for this topic, um, how SV support works today, uh, how it doesn't work today, um, a proposed solution that I have, and uh, what these causes to the rest of GDB, GDB server and the remote protocol. Um, <clears throat> well, um, the most interesting part I think is uh, the proposed solution. So uh, I think the previous parts are important for context, but I'll try, and, I'll try to get to the solution uh, and not run into the coffee break, which I believe is a felony offense in some jurisdictions, so I'll try not to do that. Um, so why, why am I interested in this? Um, in my case, it's for the ARCH64 SV extension. So what is that? Um, it provides um, an extension to the existing vector registers in the processor. Normally, they are uh, 128 bits long. So you have like uh, the V0 there, for example, the V registers are the regular vector registers and the extension adds the Z registers, which overlap, the lower uh, bits overlap with the V0 registers in the, this example. Um, so the minimum size of Z registers is 128 bits, but it can be bigger. And uh, how big it is depends on the processor implementation, and it can also change at runtime. The one advantage of this is that you can write software that doesn't care about the vector size in your processor implementation, so the same binary works optimized um, with, I don't know, a CPU with 256-bit registers, or 128, or 1,000, uh, 1,024, doesn't matter. So one word of warning is about nomenclature. Um, there are three main ways to talk about the vector length. The most direct one, straightforward, is the vector length, abbreviated to VL, so it's either in bytes or bits. Uh, but you can also um, talk about it in terms of vector granule, which is um, multiples of 64-bit chunks, or in vector quotient terms, which is multiple of 128 bit chunks. So the Linux kernel normally works with VL. Uh, so that's what the bitrace interface provides. Um, it, in cases where you are dealing with hardware, it may make sense to talk about uh, in terms of quotient, because 128 bits is the minimum increment to the uh, vector size. So GDB has to pick one option uh, to work with, and um, we picked uh, VG, the second one, <laughs> because the dwarf extension for SV um, specifies a VG pseudo register that that uh, um, controls the the, vector, the size of the vector types. Um, Apart from SV, it, this is useful for other architectures as well. Example being uh, AMX Intel extension. I'm not 
very familiar with it, but um, as far as I understand, it also has variable sized <clears throat> vectors and matrices. Um, so, so they have a use for, for variable size registers. Um, there are some differences, for, for example, um, the sizing information is not only dependent on a register content in the case of Intel. Um, there are, I think, some part of information coming from CPU ID and maybe other, other things. But I believe my solution can work in that case. I'll, I'll mention uh, later. And they also need the flexibility to add or remove registers, which we don't need in SV. So I don't address that requirement. But uh, I think that is orthogonal to, to this approach that I will propose. So um, I think my approach helps them in the case of, of the variable length of the registers. And it doesn't help nor hinder the, the other requirement. And yesterday I learned that uh, Intel GPU devices also have the same thing. They have vector sizes with variable sizes and they also need flexibility to add or remove registers. Okay, so um, how these uh, requirements uh, work out in terms of GDB internals. Um, the, main, the main GDB concept uh, here is the target description. So um, what, what is it? Um, essentially an XML document we, to describe the, the architecture that GDB is dealing with. Um, most importantly, the registers, including their size and their type, but it can also contain information about the OS ABI, for example. Um, it, the XML document came up to improve um, support for remote debugging uh, when you have um, embedded CPUs that, that there are many variants of a CPU and with slight differences, it's easier to just send a, an XML document with the exact um, specification of that CPU rather than having everything hard-coded in, in GDB itself. But it's also used for native debugging for practical reasons. It, it's helpful for that as well to let GDB organize its, its knowledge of, of the architectures that it supports. And uh, very much um, coupled with this, there's also a data structure in memory, both in GDB and GDB server, that is um, um, a mirror of the XML document. So when you talk about target description, it could be either of those, and there's not much difference in practice. Um, and there's a maintenance command that you can use to print the current uh, data structure in memory, either as an XML document or as a C function that, that uh, creates and populates the data structure. And the ctdesk command is what GDB uses to generate its own code that, that is checked into the source tree when, when a new architecture is added or updated. Um, so registers are grouped into features. So you have core, core feature, for example, with core registers like a, um, program counters, stack pointer, integer registers. There's a normally a separate floating point feature that can also include a vector um, registers. Uh, ARCH64 also has a pointer authentication feature, which is a, its own registers and so on. So this is how it looks like. Um, I hope it's readable. So just very quickly, uh, it's readable. Uh, okay, so just very quickly, you can see that um, the reg uh, tag takes a bit size and a type and the direct register number. Uh, the register number is how GDB internally references the register and it's also important because it defines the order that the registers are sent in the remote protocol that will be important later. 
um, the vector tag below is not defining the vector register, but it's defining a type that will be used when defining the vector register, which I'm not showing here the, the reg definition for, for the vector registers. And uh, besides it, the equivalent C code, uh, it's very close. So uh, how does this work for SV currently? Uh, for SV, unfortunately, we need one target definition for, for every vector length. So uh, when GDB starts debugging the program, it figures out the vector length and uh, generates a target description specifically for that vector length. So it's not, not an ideal solution. So here, here is the code. Uh, you can see that it takes uh, the function takes a scale argument that will define the size here below in the tdesk create reg call um, the size is, is depending on the argument and because of that it's not possible to have a, an XML document that uh, is generic enough for for all vector lengths so uh, this is why, this is what we try to solve, uh, both with the patches that I sent before and with this new approach. So how how it works in the code? So very quickly, I don't. Um, basically, you have a, a target uh, method called get thread architecture that GDB calls when it needs the, to know details about the inferior architecture. Um, these method allows returning a different thread, sorry, a different uh, architecture for each thread in the process if you want, or, or if you don't, you just return the, the, the overall program's architecture. Um, so this, this function doesn't return a target description, it returns a, a structure called a GDB arch, which is, um, very, it's. I think I believe there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a GDB arch and a target description. Uh, so you can, if you have one, you can get the other, and vice versa. So the first thing this function does, the thread architecture in the case of ARch64, is to call ptrace to get the SV register buffer, and inside of that buffer there's a header, and uh, the header tells the vector length. So the vector length. GDB converts to the vector quotient uh, value uh, and compares it to what it currently has in the in inferior wide um, GDB arch. If it's the same, then you just return the, the GDB arch and everything works as usual. If it's different, um, it means we need a new target description and uh, here I'm only showing the VQ as argument, but it's actually a structure with other parameters as well, like the TLS. If, if there is TLS arch, uh, architecture feature or SME as well, and, and so on. And uh, this uh, ARCH64 read description function caches the value of the target description it generates, so, but it can return it quickly if, if it's a target description that was already seen before, but if not, it will create one uh, and, and convert it to a GDB arch to return. Um, yeah, so, so this mechanism is also used by AMD GPU support for recognizing GPU threads, um, but I won't get into that. And I'm not sure if anyone else uses it. I don't think so. Um, so here's just just quickly how, how the the create target description fun function works. You create it goes through each feature, and if if it's there, it creates creates the relevant section of the target description, and you can see. Uh, in the if first if clause, like if features.vq equals zero, means that there's no SV, so you return the FPU feature if there is. 
a VQ value, then you return a SV feature, which takes the VQ argument. Uh, this is the function that I showed before. So what is the problem if, if this works? Uh, this works for native debugging, but here I show a remote debugging session. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is a program in the test suite which goes in a loop changing the vector length, uh, halving it each, each, each iteration of the loop. Uh, so you can see that currently VG is four, which means uh, four times 64 bit, so this is a 256 bit uh, vector uh, length, uh, and we are going to halve it. Um, and we can see that currently the size of the Z0 register is 32 bytes, which is correct. Uh, here we are setting values for, for Z0 because it's an init, the, the program in the test, the test suite doesn't initialize it, so it's garbage. Uh, we are setting the first half of the vector to the unsigned int integer one, and the second half of the register uh, to unsigned int integer two. So uh, each half is 128 bits. So af after we run this uh, ptrace command, uh, the return value is 16, which means that the kernel was able to change the vector length. And you can see that this reflects in in the VG value, but it doesn't reflect in Z0. And if you print the Z0 uh, contents, it's garbage, so it didn't work. <laughs> so we try to see what happened if, if the Z0 register is still somehow functional. We set again uh, the integers as before and run one more line, and we can see that the first half worked but the second half is still garbage. So this is, this is what currently happens. If, if you don't change, if you debug a remote application that doesn't change um, the vector length, it works, but if it does, then this, this happens. Uh, so what, what, what is the, the problem here? So in the case of GDB server, uh, the problem is that uh, it doesn't know uh, that VG is special, so it doesn't do anything when its value changes. And on the GDB side, the remote target doesn't provide the thread architecture method that I was showing before. So the solution for the native uh, case isn't uh, available to, to the remote target because it doesn't have this method. So, so a natural idea is to provide this uh, thread architecture method um, to the remote target, and that's what I did in all the patch series that I sent so far. Um, so by the way, uh, thank you everyone who reviewed my patches. Uh, the discussions were very, very fruitful, very important. Uh, and in the discussions of the last patch series, um, some concerns came up, and I agree with them. So the first one is that um, SV programs, even if they have different vector lengths in different threads, uh, it's still conceptually the same architecture in all threads. So using a method that provides a different architecture for each thread, it's not conceptually not a great fit. It can work, but... Uh, Maybe there's a better idea, and also so needing a different target description for each vector length is also can work, but uh, seems overkill. And there's no, if you think about it, there's no reason why the target description can't be extended to be flexible enough for, for the SV case. Question. Yes. Um, I thought at the beginning you said for SVE, it's, it's a property that can be changed dynamically and the thread can change it. So now I, I don't understand why you say SV programs don't have a different architecture or register set in each different thread. Doesn't this? Well, when, when the vector length changes, GDB creates a new 
um, target description or a new architecture for it. I don't know if, if yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. Can you repeat the question? Maybe so I didn't understand. I, I mean, now I'm, I'm reading this, this bullet, mm -hmm. the first one after but. SV programs don't have a different architecture or register set in each different thread. Yes. But I, as far as I remember, at the very beginning of the talk, you said that the variable size register can be changed dynamically by, by thread itself. Yes. Does, don't, I mean, I don't this is a conflict. No, why? Because it, it, it's not changing the architecture, it's changing the length of the registers in the architecture. Or, or the, the length of the register, it's not changing the architecture itself. Yeah, architecture. Okay, well, yeah. registers, okay, I thought register set would include register length. <laughs> the property, so yeah. Okay, maybe that's yeah. that's yeah, the mismatch. That's probably the sticky point. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and is that the reason why we are setting a different architecture to work around that? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So historically, uh, historically in the past, you had an architecture that would give you a fixed um, set of registers with a fixed set of properties, and that's starting to change. And now you can have one architecture, and the properties of the registers is not going to be the same over time. That can change a bit, and SV is one example of that. So like, yeah, o over time, we change the definition of what architecture mi might mean. Yeah, it, it's a question of making GDB more flexible, uh, I think. Just, so, sorry, just yes. a quick comment, just to give some context. Uh, the way the ESV stuff was implemented in GDB this way is, the reason why is, because SV types are technically what we call sizeless, which are dynamic, depending on the vector length, but GDB, at the time didn't have a good mechanism for the dynamic size in its type system, so what we came up with was the different target descriptions which works, but it's a bit cumbersome to represent this stuff. So yeah, you're right that the architecture is still the same, the register set is, is still the same, but the size of the, the set changes a little bit in the kernel, but GDB didn't have a good way to deal with that. So. So the, the one point here is that this hack of having one target description per vector length and that generates one GDB arch does not have a big consequence because it, it was all on the native side. It's all built into GDB. It's just a, an implementation detail. But now you want to do this with GDB server, which implies fixing a, a design, a spec, uh, changing the GDB protocol and you know, deciding this is how it should be done. And it's a protocol, so you're going to have to support this forever. So you want to do it right. Well, before you just punt it. You know, it's an implementation detail. But now you want to do it right. Yes, that's exactly it. Like uh, the, the previous patch versions that I sent required some extensions to the remote protocol. So that meant if later we came up with a better idea that we would either have to support the old way forever or define a deprecation period, things like that. If, if we can get it right the first time, we can avoid um, that situation. So that's, I think that's the main, uh, main idea here. So any more questions? Yes. And uh, as time goes on, uh, there will be architectures where the number of combinations of, uh, uh, of target description can be really huge. Like now you have a few, but. Yeah, you, you mean that more architectures can get uh, variable size registers? Is that it? Yeah, I, I don't know if it would be a problem, but if you have, yes, it's not a problem because they're dynamically generated. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick note. Yeah, as we afterwards, after the SV stuff was in place, then as we added more features, so then things started to get a bit unwieldy. Because then you have a new feature, you have to consider the combination 
with the SVE variations as well. So you're piling on top of all the combinations of SVE and like more features and more combinations. Yes. That's why we have all those checks. Yeah, also I believe this will work for SME as well, but I haven't uh, done the, the change yet for SME, but uh, should, should work for the SME case as well. Um, okay. Sorry? Yeah, 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 exactly. So what now? Um, yeah, uh, this is the problem that we have. So GDB, like Luis said, uh, lately, uh, in the past few years, GDB improved, gained and improved support for dynamic types. Um, so what's, uh, what's can, what can we do? Can we, we use um, the target description, can we make the target description use the dynamic types? And I found a way. So let me describe, let me describe how it works. Um, okay, so um, I want to know from this talk if you think the idea is reasonable. Um, so we have a uh, in Dwarf, we have a, a types with dynamic attributes for Fortran, Fortran arrays originally. Um, they have Dwarf location expressions associated with them, and uh, this, is, this location expression is a bytecode that is stack-based, so you can interpret the bytecode, and um, at the end, uh, at the top of the stack, the value will be what you what you wanted, so we can use this to specify um, uh, the the vector length. So that that's the idea. And and the good thing is that GDB already uses dynamic types infrastructure for even for static arrays. So we're not changing a lot of things here. Just a few. So this is how. GDB currently constructs a vector type. Uh, this function takes an integer argument for the number of elements and the type of the elements. Um, so you have the range type field there. And, and from all, all the, the, the elements that were set in this structure, you can calculate the, the length of the type. So we need, the question is how so, so first, well, sorry, first uh, I'll talk a little bit about the range type here, uh, which defines the, the, the index um, type of, of the vector. So how do you get one by calling this function? Um, the index type is normally integer, and then you pass a low bound and a high bound. So um, it uses these strict range bounds, which take the, uh, these dynamic properties, low, high, and stride, but I'm not using stride, but I'm showing here just for completeness. So then the low bound and the high bound are constants uh, in the current code. Um, so that's it. So how, how do you make it dynamic? Uh, so the only change uh, is the last argument of, of the function. I created a new function that instead of taking a high bound long, it takes a location expression and then puts it in, in the range bound structure. Uh, uh, well, since I only need the high uh, bound to be dynamic, uh, I only created code to, to get from zero to, to high bound to, to a location expression. So with this range, we can stick it into the vector uh, structure, ty uh, type structure. And since now we cannot immediately calculate the, the length of the type, it's set to zero. Uh, this, is ex this setting of zero is existing code. I didn't add that, so GDB already has to deal with today with uh, length zero arrays uh, because of the dwarf support I was mentioning. Uh, so now I talked about the GDB uh, struct 
type side of things. Now, looking from the target description side, there's also some, some type structures for describing the types used in, vec in, in registers. Uh, this is a simpler structure because it's just a description and, and it will be matched by GDB into a, a GDB type. So in the case of vector, you have a, a string name, uh, you have element type and you have a count. Uh, and uh, this is an example of it being used in a target description uh, C uh, code. So the dynamic version gets a location expression argument. I am also defining a location expression string argument, which is just for pretty printing, basically, when converting, um, when generating the C code, it allows uh, the string, location expression string allows to use the DOR, the constants, like DW, op, B regex, things like that makes things easier to read. Um, so, yeah, and then this code will show up in the C, in the generated C uh, function. Yeah, so this is how it changes. When, when, this is a part of the par XML parser. So in the top, you have existing code, uh, just init vector type with the, the count E is the current um, XML element that we are processing. And the, with the new code, uh, E uh, can have the allocation expression. And if it does, we pass it to init vector type. If not, it's the same as before. And uh, this is how it looks like in the XML. So I'm using, uh, sorry, I'm using uh, MathML because I don't want to create uh, syntax myself. And uh, MathML has two kinds of markup. Uh, we are using the content markup because we don't need to render any mathematical expression and uh, the content markup is good for evaluate, evaluating the mathematical expression. So uh, the math element contains all MathML um, tags and I'm using the apply tag which applies an operation or function and uh, in this case, apply uses the times uh, operator. And uh, the CI element is a content identifier, which is used for variables. Here, as a hack, I'm using 85, which is the register number for the vec uh, vector granule register. But uh, when it's, I think it's very easy to change to accept a string uh, with dollar sign VG. I'll do that before sending the patch. And and here is where, uh, yeah, yeah, and below the, the other argument to the multiplication uh, content uh, number. So it's just the number eight. So this is multiplying VG by eight. And here is where I think um, it could work for Intel. So the CI tag could have, instead of dollar sign VG, it could have dollar sign I don't know, CPU ID underscore something, and that variable would mean um, what, what is necessary to calculate the, the vector length in that case. So it can be flexible. I think of it a bit as like a GDB convenience variables uh, in a way. Uh, one thing I don't do here that I think I should is add the XML namespace to the math tag, um, I, I, I'll do that before sending the patch. But I don't use any fancy XML processing, it's just to be, to be compliant. Um, and so you can, uh, the GDB code can go back and forth between both representations. Now with that main uh, print command that I showed at the beginning, it works. So, so okay, uh, how does that impact um, GDB, the rest of GDB? Because this, this is uh, basically what we need. So first, uh, it has issues, it creates issues for the register cache. 
So briefly, what, what is it? Uh, register cache is what it says on the tin, um, and it's a right, right through regist uh, register cache. And uh, the important thing is, well, there are two important things. It has one big buffer for all registers, um, and when it, when it needs to read or write or the contents of a register, it goes, it knows the offset into the big buffer to, to look into, and the type of the register tells it the size that it needs to, to use. And um, yeah, also it, it knows, because of that, it also knows the type and size of each register. It's not exactly in the reg cache itself. Uh, it's in the internet structure called the reg cache description, uh, which can be reached from from the reg cache, and uh, you can also reach the the reg cache description via GDB Arch. So there are places in GDB that don't have a register cache but have a GDB Arch, and uh, in those places it can still. Um, get the, the type and size of each register and, and sometimes that can be an issue um, because with, if, if, if that code is trying to find out the size of a variable size register, it will need a register cache available to, to get to calculate the, the, the size. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, uh, this feature creates a dependency be between two registers, which we didn't have before. And um, in the case of SV, that you have a dependency that the Z registers depend on, on the value of VG. So to deal with that, I added the concept of load early registers. Um, the name, I don't know, I just, uh, I'm not attached to it. Uh, we can discuss. Uh, so if, if a register appears in, in a vector count expression when GDB is, is interpreting the target description, then it adds the register to the load early list. In the case of SV, VG will go there. So when GDB needs to populate a register cache, it will go first uh, through the, the load early list to populate them early. So this happens, for example, um, when it gets the, all, the, all the registers from the remote. I'll show that later. Um, GDB server also has a reg register cache with basically the same, the same issues. Uh, so this is all done in GDB server as well. And in the case of GDB server, it adds the load early registers to the exp as an expedited register in stop replies. I'll, I'll mention that later as well. Um, so the, the second problem is that buffer containing all the contents uh, I split into the fixed size registers uh, and another buffer for var variable size registers. The pro this is because when you, when you instantiate a register cache, uh, it's very common that you don't have enough information yet to know the size of the dynamic register, the dynamic types. Um, so you have to delay the allocation of the buffer for the variable size registers. And uh, the second problem, like I mentioned before, um, sometimes if, if the GDB is trying to figure out the size of a variable size register, it needs the reg cache. The, just having the GDB arch is not enough anymore. So for that, for those reasons, I added uh, methods to the reg cache called the uh, register size and register type, and that that is a good point to to do the delayed initialization of 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 the uh, content buffer for for the variable size registers and for resolving the dynamic types into uh, static types for for them as well. Uh, this is working well. So, yeah, so also if, if GDB detects that a load early register changed, it has to do that to, I don't know, uh, invalidate, like refree the buffer, uh, invalid, uh, free the, the types and do it again. 
later if it's necessary. And also, also another thing that helped me was changing some some methods, both in the red cache and in frame uh, informate frame handling. When they want to get or set uh, the contents of a register, they just pass a pointer to a buffer without a size. And since uh, I'm dealing a lot with chain different sizes, I'm not confident enough that that uh, GDB will always know the, the size that it should be using. So to guarantee that, I changed some methods to use a, an array view that always contains the size of the buffer that is being passed around. Uh, so I think that's a good improvement. OK, um, so for the remote series, sorry. Oh, OK, sorry. Uh, just make sure I understand. Uh, so when you, say, when you said that uh, when processing the target description, you detect that VG is a load early. So does it mean that it will appear, even though in the target description it's after the VZ, uh, Z register? In the register buffer of the red cache, it will appear, it, at least in, I guess in, in the GDB register numbering, it will appear before the Z? No, I don't change the register numbering. It, it will be exactly the same. In the GStop reply, it will be still in the last position, nothing changes. Uh, so what will happen is that before the G packet, GDB will have to fetch just that one register. Yeah. But I think that's the remote register number, but I think it might be different than the internal. Like, what I, what I'm, where I'm going at is that if it appeared, I'm wondering why you need two buffers. I was thinking you could just have one, but if you ensure that all the, the registers that are, have a static size are first, and it's just the end that can vary, Mm -hmm. Could have just one, and it, and worst case, you, if it's a vector, you increase it or increase or decrease its uh, size. You mean that only internally in GDB, or also in the remote protocol? No, just in in, in the in, red cache buffer. Ah, okay, yeah, that yeah, maybe that could work. Like if making it load early makes it appear before in the register buffer, I think I think you could get away with just one, but it would be a vector instead of a mm -hmm. static array. That could work, I think. Okay, so but can we clarify the G packet? Are you going to be talking about that, the, like the buffer? I, I, so I will talk the next topic. I'll, I'll get into the G packet. PG is at the end. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll experiment with, with that solution and, and see maybe it will simplify things a bit. Uh, so for this remote protocol, just quick overview, it's ASCII based, GDB sends a command and GDB server or stub sends a reply. It has this format of packet data and checksum. So the example here is the G command which GDB asks the remote for all the register contents and it's just a byte stream, like big byte stream and, and the GDB and GDB server have to agree where each byte star, which register comes before the other and also the size of each, otherwise you cannot, you cannot parse these. So uh, yeah, the issue is that unfortunately uh, SV registers come before VG, so this cannot work. Uh, my life would have been easier if, if VG came first. Uh, but I didn't want to change the remote protocol, so I, I yeah, I tried to, to make it work this way. So this is what happens when GDB and GDB server don't agree, like GDB is expecting 308 bytes, but GDB server sent 644 bytes. So this happened a lot while I was developing this feature. It's a bit frustrating, but it uh, doesn't happen anymore. Um, so to deal with that, one way we that GDB can get the VG value first is with expedited register. So this is a feature of the stop reply packet, which is sent every time the remote program stops, GDB server or the stub sends the stop reply packet. In this case, in this example, it's a 05 is the trap signal, it's a software breakpoint, and uh, there's a sequence of 
um, name value pairs separated by colon. So uh, these are the first ones are register numbers and register values. So 1D is the X29 register, which can be used as a frame pointer. Uh, 1F is a stack pointer. 20, all these are in X. Uh, 20 is uh, the program counter, and, 20, and the, la the last one, 20, uh, 55, is the VG. So you can see here that VG is uh, 4, which means 256-bit vector registers. And then you have other information like the thread, PID and L, uh, LWP and the core core ID. So this is a good good fit for for the load early register. So GDB just sends the load early registers with the the expedited registers, and that that works well. Um, I had to add a new target method so that when GDB creates a register cache, um, the target has an opportunity to supply the initial registers, and I use this in the remote target to supply the expedited registers. So that, that works well. Um, unfortunately, not always uh, it will be the case that you have a stop reply handy when you, when you need to create a register cache. So, Sometimes GDB needs to to request the the register uh, contents, and uh, in that case, uh, there's an issue right now because um, there is a packet that you can use to get only one register, which is the P packet. But uh, GDB server doesn't implement it, so it always when it wants one register, it just gets all of them. And this is uh, the fetch registers using G function there. Um, so this causes problems because GDB will get the buffer without knowing the VG value and it cannot parse it, um, the, the contents of the, the, the registers that it gets as a reply. So I implemented the P packet in GDB server. It's uh, simple. Uh, implementation and, and inside these fetch registers using G function, I added some code that if there's if there are any load early registers that that we need, we fetch them individually using the P packet, and then after that we do the regular G packet thing, and that that works as well. Uh, and that's it. Right. I'm surprised that I didn't go over time, so. And uh, there's even time for questions, so... I have one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Barris, I had the mic first. <laughs> um, so, one comment is, there is nothing in the protocol that forces you to keep VG at the end. Um, uh, the order of the registers is completely up to the target description. And then there's, there's a match between the register number and the internal register number inside GDB. So, you can just move it up. It will not break anything. Uh, it's well, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll try that. Maybe I misunderstood the code because I I see it hard coded in in the uh, in the AR sixty forty dep files. There's a hard coded uh, expectation of VG being number eighty five, but uh, I don't know about that, that matching. That I don't might know. be an implementation detail. I'm saying in the protocol. In the remote protocol, there's nothing that forces you to have that order of registers if you have a target description. So if you do not have a target description, say it's a really simple embedded target mm -hmm. and only knows about the, the G packet, mm -hmm. no description at all. Some architectures in GDB, like old ones, mm -hmm. that predated XML support even, mm -hmm. they would hard code the layout of the G packet. Mm -hmm. Um, but with target descriptions, if you have them, then you can swap the order of the registers in the, reg in the G packet as long as it matches the order in the XML file. Okay. So but you're free to swap it, and then internally GDB matches the register number to the internal number. There are two different numbers, and there's a mapping. Okay. So yeah, that would make some things easier. Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, Just so specify that it has to come first. Yeah, I'll definitely try that. If it works, then then yeah, could have been a shorter talk. 
doesn't that have a problem with backwards compatibility with some stubs, remote stubs, that always send the VG in the final place? That is built into GDB, but you're not doing that, right? You're sending an XML. Right, yes. And are you planning on supporting SVE stubs that do not send an XML? No. So? No, yeah. <clears throat> um, in Intel GPU downstream debugger, so okay, let uh, let me first say another thing. So the GDB server is by default all stop. So when a thread stop stops, it sends the stop packet together with the expedited registers. But if at this point the user does info threads, which would query the other stop threads, mm -hmm. GDB is going to send the G packet. So mm -hmm. that's the problem that you hit. I think, um, be, because for the other threads, GDB didn't receive expedited register values. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, for Intel GPU um, downstream debugger, okay, this creates one other problem, which is performance. So threads have large register sets, and query, I mean, getting all the registers with the G packet. Um, for all the threads, which is which is several thousands, creates a lot of overhead. And for this, we added an E packet, which would be similar to I think what 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 you did. The E packet stands for expedited registers. Mm -hmm. Instead of G, mm -hmm. we set we send E, and it for for each thread, it actually receives the uh, the list of expedited registers, which would be. Um, I mean, for, for many cases, it just speeds up, speeds up things because the whole register set is most likely not needed. Mm -hmm. So you, you can say it's a, it's a partial load of, 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 of the registers. Mm -hmm. um, um, so so I, I think it was, uh, it was interesting to see, uh, um, uh, to see your approach, which, which could have worked for us too, but I think we would like to avoid at least the number of uh, round trips uh, that would require uh, doing it individually with P. Um, another thing is we have, we have some, I mean, so you, you mentioned this at the beginning, we have another problem, which is that GP, GPU threads may have, may change their register sets, not the length, but the number of registers. Mm -hmm. So in one mode, they can have 128 general purpose registers. In another mode, the, 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 um, the GPU can be programmed so that it will have half the number of threads, but each thread is going to have double the number of mm -hmm. registers. Um, so I think we will need to think about how to... You may um, need... You may need uh, to change the, the architecture in that situation, maybe. Yeah. Yes, so we were, we were relying on version one of your patches, um, which would add a target description for each thread. Mm -hmm. And we were changing them. Um, but now I think we will need to, we will need to think about how to... Um, now, I mean, yeah. given that, that that version hasn't been finalized, um, now we will need to think about how to maybe continue uh, this approach. Yeah. 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 I can't think of. They. I don't think they conflict. I think um, they. They are orthogonal. You can have that patch series and also this one to complement. So, if if it doesn't work, let me know and we can talk about it and 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 okay, discuss thank it. You. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, Simon and Pedro have questions. I don't know if it will be possible, but maybe you can extend the target description thing further like he did to say like n copy of a register, like the number of copies of that register depends on some expression. And 
I did like that. I actually have two questions. So one question for you. In your XML extensions, you have CI, I think, was for yes. the vector for the register number. And they said that could be extended to be something else, like a register name or like you Yeah, I want to something. How would yes. we know which what does eighty five mean? That that it is a register. Yes, so so yeah, this is why this is a hack now uh, for now because the CI tag um, means identifier, which in the MathML uh, specification, the CI tag is used for variables. So normally it's a string, it's not a number, so I, I just hacked a number in there. But uh, if, if I put in, uh, a dollar sign VG there, I think we can cre we can create some syntax to make okay. it unambiguous, but maybe dollar sign uh, Would and mean register name. Yeah, well, yeah, possibly yes. So we have to come up with with a syntax for that. I suspect there will be cases where it will be useful useful to put a memory address there. Um, a memory, uh, uh, some value in memory. Ah, Computer okay, that. Some memory. That could work as well. We can make it Might work. Might be useful to think about how that could fit in. Um, yeah. The second question was actually for Barry's. You <coughs> mentioned the e-packet. No, that was that's, a, that's an interesting idea. But did did you think about putting that information in the XML that describes the the, the thread list, and decided not to for some reason? Uh, yes, we we also added to to XML so that um, right at the beginning when we are attaching, the target sends the list of expedited registers, so GDB can know from the very beginning uh, which registers to query to to start querying with with the e-packet. No, just the names, just the names. Oh, that XML, you mean? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That was an option. We, I mean, we could have done it, uh, but we, we prefer to, to basically delay it further to the point where the, the user would actually want to um, query. So, so you just have a names and no values? One, okay, um, sorry. One peculiar thing in our case is we model the hardware threads, so the list stays stable. We don't in one case, we just sent the sent, sent the, the, the thread in for XML, and that's it. It stays stable. So in update threads, we don't need to refetch it because we model hardware threads. But this this changed later on with this register mode that I mentioned because the the, the mode of the register can can change, and we need to query GDB server to check whether, whether the thread properties have changed. And there we can include the expedited registers. We, di we didn't. Yeah, we, we we didn't we didn't measure this. I I think it would it could work. Yes, but I no no I I understand it it could work. But we we didn't we didn't measure the cost actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I sorry. Can, I can give you more. More. That. So now is the coffee break. So sorry. Sorry for taking time from your coffee break. Thank you. Thank you very much.